Hi everyone, this is Dr. Serena. We are going to be talking about the qualitative interviewing technique and some of my experiences with the interviewing process, uh, different steps that are involved with the interviewing process, uh, common pitfalls that you may face during the interviewing process, and actually how to analyze the data that you receive from the interviewing technique. So let's just get started. Um, so there are several definitions of interviewing and how to accomplish interviewing, but essentially what it is is that we're trying to uncover the participants' meaning of some particular topic, how they interpret that topic, how they their particular experiences with some particular topic, or it's also useful as a follow-up. So you could do some uh, follow-up research after you do like a quantitative survey or some sort of quantitative study or a content analysis. So for example, one of my friends, he uh, did a study looking at um, the use of a uh, citing of women as news sources in news articles or people of diversity and what he found for the most part there was low diversity within news articles and so what he wanted to do was understand quantitative can tell you that that's happening but qualitative actually tells you and helps you understand why that's happening and so what he did after he did the quantitative survey he actually did uh, an interview with uh, different news reporters and he found out basically that really reporters weren't aware that they weren't citing uh, females or people of different backgrounds and so it was just a simple lack of awareness but it was just kind of a nice little bit of information that quantitative can't always get at so let's look at some different aspects of qualitative interviews. So it's far more personal, and so you're working directly with the respondent, and so you have an opportunity to try truly understand that participant and that participant's experiences. And as I stated in the previous slide, there's an opportunity to probe or ask follow-up questions, which you can't always get with quantitative. A common question, especially in uh, client research or if you're working for some organization, they'll ask you why. Why is it why is it like this? Why? Tell me why. And oftentimes you cannot answer that with quantitative research. And so interviews provide a great opportunity to get at that. Um, interviews are pretty much easier for a respondent because really it should be it should resemble a, a conversation and so that's kind of why it might feel a little bit more at ease um, but sometimes what I find is that is social scientists what we're trying to do is identify these abstract things in nature and oftentimes participants have difficulty uh, verbalizing these experiences and so it's actually your job as an interviewer to ask certain open-ended que questions that encourage the respondent to feel confident and also enable them to better express their circumstances so just be aware that sometimes you want or you're seeking or you think that the answers might go in a certain direction but you don't know because um, it's often harder to, it's often harder for um, participants to express themselves. So just keep that in mind and just think about some questions that might uh, empower them a bit more to talk about their experience. Um, interviews are very time consuming and so uh, right now I'm doing some a set of interviews and I started when did I start? I think in February. And I'm still interviewing because a lot of times it takes at least usually about an hour of your time and an hour of the participants time and they're also resource intensive and so oftentimes what I have to do is schedule that time set up the recording and then I either transcribe the interview myself or I pay a service to transcribe the uh, interview and that transcription cost is usually around a dollar to two dollars per minute just an FYI for you um, I often use a service called uh, audiotranscription.org um, it's one of the more affordable options that I have found um, and then the interviewer is considered a part of the measurement instrument and so the interviewer has to be well trained um, I'm going to stress this throughout this lecture, the importance, if you're not conducting the interview yourself, the importance of training and taking the time to train um, your uh, people who are doing the interviews properly. So, uh, and I'll talk about that because I've worked with several research assistants 
over the years and there's this kind of this is assumption that there's this ease of interviewing and interviewing is easy but it's not and so this is why it's really important to do proper training and I'm going to talk about ways to train interviewers if you ever uh, have that luxury so there's kind of two major types of interviews that I want to talk about um, the first one is uh, semi-structured and so the semi-structured is really the interview approach that I tend to always in, uh, use. So this semi-structured is kind of focuses on more of a more conversational approach. Um, there's a bit more uh, a degree of freedom and adaptability in getting the information from the interviewee. Um, in the unstructured or semi-structured setting, you kind of keep the conversation focused on the topic while giving the informant room to define the content within the discussion setting. So the idea, idea is, is that you want to get the informant to talk about the topic and then just kind of get out of the way. And only your job is, is to kind of understand and probe deeper about their understanding of that particular topic. Um, so it's not you have a set list of questions, but you don't necessarily have to ask all of them or you don't necessarily have to stick to the script. You kind of go with the flow of the conversation and the question list is just to make sure you've covered everything and that every uh, participant kind of gets asked the same types of questions. Whereas the structured open-ended interview, um, all respondents are asked the same questions in the same order, and this facilitates um, faster interviews, and it's more easily compared when they're all asked the same exact question. And so this format is useful perhaps for those who are not practiced in interviewing or the interviewing um, methodology. So it might be uh, uh, something you want to do and that's why you would want to do it in those situations but I am more of an advocate of the semi-structured because the whole point of qualitative is really to really get people to understand and understand their situation so that's why I tend to do that so telephone interviews um, I tend to do quite a few telephone slash Skype interviews and the reason being is because um, I want to get a diversity, a, a certain diversity of people to represent some topic. So if I interview only people from one uh, t uh, television newsroom or I interview people from only one organization, it somewhat limits my ability to build theory and generalize that knowledge. It's useful information for that particular organization. Um, but some people might question the um, usefulness of my research. So I like with telephones, I can call people from who I think are most appropriate to speak about that subject. Another thing I do too is um, I go to sometimes conferences and so uh, a professional or academic conference, what you'll see is a lot of people from all over the world descending on one place at one particular time. And I also find it's easier to get people to, to get people to interview. So it's often hard to get people to say, yes, I'll do an interview with you via the phone um, when you're contacting them uh, over email or such. Okay, but just know, this is another tip too, is when you're talking to someone on the phone, they feel you feel like they get fatigued after a certain point. Um, and so what I find is around 30-ish minutes, uh, the callers tend to want to kind of just stop the phone call or just kind of just, they're tired. So it's up to you to keep the, uh, uh, to kind of manage the pace of the conversation, to be excited about the research, uh, to get them to really be an active listener. So to encourage them to speak a bit longer than maybe a 30 minute phone call. So just FYI. Um, it's up to you to kind of make sure that there's some energy there in that conversation in order to encourage the participant to continue with the phone call past, you know, the 15, 30 minute mark. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so 
interviewer training is critical. So this is this is what I find is that I was really shocked by the uh, poor quality of information received when I didn't do sufficient interviewer training. So what I I have several students who either volunteer to work on research projects or I actually have research assistants. And what happens is, is I'll do like I'll do a phone call. What I did in the past is, and I, you can learn from my mistakes. So what I would do is I would do a couple phone calls in the past and said, okay, did you see how I did that? Um, and then I would hand it over to them. Um, but what happens is, is if you don't, you don't do multiple sessions and observe multiple sessions, you will get information that's quite shallow. So the whole point is to explore their world. And what happens oftentimes is, is that uh, novice uh, interviewers, what they'll do is just go down their list of questions and they'll stick to that script. And the respondent says some really interesting things related to the research, but we don't see a lot of probing. Like, what do you mean by that? Um, how do you think that came to be? Or oh, uh, so tell me, what did you do in the past about that issue? Or things like that. It's like a normal conversation if you're listening. But um, what I find is oftentimes if the person that you train is not familiar with that subject, there isn't kind of that intellectual curiosity sometimes. Uh, another common mistake is um, so you, if you're unfamiliar with the actual study, is if you look, you're sticking to this script, you ask questions and maybe you're writing notes off to the side, and there's these very awkward long pauses during the actual interview. Um, it, makes, it makes the participant feel very awkward. So you have to kind of keep that flow of conversation going with not too many awkward long pauses. Um, a lack of engagement with the subject. So this happens because you might do, let's say, 20 interviews. And you just kind of start it kind of gets old after a while, but it's really critical for you to be excited, to to engage that participant, to be, you know, to feel grateful that they're taking the time out of their life to talk to you about this. And so um, that's something I never forget because these are people who are volunteering their time and most often not getting paid for their efforts. And then also just recording mistakes. So I record every interview that I do. So you want to make sure not only that it recorded, but you have good audio quality. It is impossible to transcribe interviews with poor audio quality. So I've had situations where a big portion of my research could not happen because of recording mistakes. So after each interview, you wanna double check, and make sure that it's recorded properly um, and that you can understand the respondent. And maybe you even use two recording devices to make sure that you don't, um, you have that information. Okay, so let's see, points for interviewing training. Okay, this is really important. So when you are in the interview setting and you're talking to the participant, what you want to do is describe what the function, what the purpose, what the intent of is the, of the study without you know, swaying their answers in a particular direction. So this just happened when I was doing interviewer training of another student that I was working with. And he didn't really describe the interview study well. And so what happened during the entire interviewer, the person just was like, well, I'm not, sh he kept saying, I'm not sure if this is what you want, or I'm not really understanding. And so there was these, uh, he, he just didn't feel comfortable answering questions because he wasn't sure what we were looking for. So it's, it's a really important that when you pick up that phone or you're in a face to face with that person, that you describe the study and why the study is important. 
And um, then you also want to, this. they will always ask this question. I get this question every time when I do an interviewing study, is explain the sampling logic and process. So what they'll say is, how did you find me? Um, why me? Like, why did you pick me? Uh, what do you, you know, so they're wanting to know how they were selected. And so it, you don't want to say, ideally, you don't want to say, well, this friend told me, or um, I Googled, you know, so you want to explain that these, the participant selection process was very thoughtful, and there was some logic behind why this individual was selected. So you take a random sample from the list, the top 100 nonprofits in the country. Um, so just think about explaining how they were selected and why they were selected and why their input was needed. And then you want to make sure, I'm going to, there's the two, this is probably the biggest mistake, is a lack of probes. So I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but probes are critical to getting quality information from the interview participant, okay? So one of the things that I do usually is I pilot test. So uh, a pilot test is basically you want to test your questionnaire with participants that have similar interests as those that will participate in that particular study. So the point of the pilot test is to assist researchers with the refinement of research questions or assist researchers in making sure that, that the uh, questionnaire the questions that you ask kind of flow nice, that the respondent is able to understand them. So you might actually conduct the interview and then afterwards ask for feedback from that respondent. Is there anything that you did not understand? Or is there anything that I can do to improve your understanding? Is there Are there any questions that maybe I should have asked? So just pilot test with both quantitative and qualitative. Um, research is really critical. So I do this always, always with quantitative surveys, and I usually do this with qualitative interviews as well. Okay, so, oh, this, <laughs> this was up here twice. Oh, well. Okay, so next, uh, I went backwards. Okay, there we go. Oops. Uh, so bias takes place by asking questions from a certain perspective. Um, you don't want to feel, you don't want the participant to make, to feel as though they're being judged or you are coming at this with already a bias about what the results should be or you prefer certain types of responses. It really will uh, jeopardize your results and um, it's just not a good thing. So what are some things that you can do to avoid bias? Well, the easiest is just simply asking open-ended questions. Uh, don't ask leading questions. And then probe issues for depth. So you hear their response and then ask follow-up questions to those respondents. And let the informant lead. Let the respondent lead. Um, so just listen and express interest in what that person says. Um, Make sure it kind of feels like more of a friendly conversation and don't don't express approval or disapproval during a um, during an interview. So open ended questions uh, open ended. So you, you this seems obvious, right, that you should ask open ended questions. But even after lots of training, we are more prone to ask close-ended questions. So even though there's training, even though the questions are listed out, I oftentimes people still want to ask these close-ended questions. So close-ended questions might be like, uh, is your hair black, brown, or red? Are you interested in research? Um, so closed-ended questions limit the breadth of information. So open-ended questions are quite simple. And so they're just like, what, where, who, when, how, why. But I want you to not use why a lot. So limit your use of the why questions. Because 
Y implies that there is a right answer. So informants' tendency to abbreviate answers when you use the word why. Um, so instead use describe or tell me about. And, and make sure to not move to a new topic until you feel that you've explored the informant's knowledge about that one particular question at hand. Hmm. Okay, so the next part is you want to make sure to allow people to answer questions in their own terms. So they're voicing their own views, their values, and experiences. Leading questions are phrased in a certain way to imply that there's a correct answer. And that's just definitely not the case in an interviewer setting. So what fears do you have when your baby's diarrhea does not stop? What actions do you take to stop his or her diarrhea? How good was the treatment of your treatment your baby got at the health center? So non-leading questions on that same topic could be asked this way. How do you feel when your baby's diarrhea does not stop? What do you do when his or her diarrhea does not stop? How do you feel about the treatment your baby got at the health center? So kind of see how I phrase those questions in order to not suggest that this person should have behaved in a certain way during that situation. Ah, probes. So stimulate an informant to produce more information. So this is one of the things that I'm going to be looking for. Um, from you. So the key to successful interviewing is learning how to probe effectively. Probes become more specific. Each interviewer, interview begins with a very, very, usually a very open-ended question. And then you just simply dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper. So for continuation, it might be, then, then what happened? Um, let's see, for elaboration, you could say, well, could you give me an example? Um, and then if you want to steer the conversation back in a particular direction, you could say, you mentioned that blah, 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 blah. So probes are the key to a great interview. So just keep that in mind. Don't just simply stick to the questions on your list. You're, you're wanting to understand the meaning of the people, of the participants in your study. So here's some probing techniques. Um, one is... One is simply what or what or who questions or why questions, um, how questions. Those are simple. Um, I'm not, I don't usually do those to be honest. Um, I tend to kind of ask for elaboration on things that the participant had said. So you might, you know, say things like, Oh, I see, you know, or interesting. So you said this. So just that's kind of like the echo probe. The aha uh -huh pro probe is uh-huh, uh-huh. You don't want to do a lot of those, um, but it's just a way to uh, let the respondent know that you're listening. So here's the ones that I mostly tend to use. So the conceptual probe, I don't know if I just called it that. So if they, what you're listening for is, so when you're doing an interview study, you're essentially looking for themes across respondents about how they uh, see this issue or interpret this issue or how they feel. So if they mention certain concepts during their interview, what you might say is, well, what do you mean by active listening? Or what do you mean um, by you have to um, understand how to behave politely in those situations or what do you mean by blah 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 or you mentioned this in this context you know so just listen to them and ask them what they mean by these particular things and that's a great way to um, get people to understand how they interpret it and when you're doing the thematic analysis it's very helpful as well because you're learning for how people interpret like how people might interpret depression how people might interpret anxiety how people might interpret 
uh, quality teacher interaction in the classroom. So you want to understand what are those themes across this particular participant group. So another one is a grand or mini tour type questions. So um, what this essentially is, you could ask a question is, could you tell me what you do there? Like describe your job. Um, you could also say, could you describe what the inside of a jail is like for me? And then for a mini tour question, you could say, could you describe what you do when you take a break at Brady's bar? Um, so these are kind of like, what do you do? Describe in detail moment by moment within a particular setting. Experience questions might be like, you've probably had some interesting experiences while you were in jail. Can you recall any experiences? And then a native language question would be, how would you refer to jail? So you're trying to understand how that particular culture and how they interact within that particular culture. So those are just some example uh, probes that you can do during the interview process. So you ask the, the main question, but then you kind of want to understand that response on a much deeper level. A tip, of course, is you mirroring. So what mirror, mirroring is essentially is that you, whatever their tone of voice, their pace of voice, their, their nonverbal body actions, you somewhat mirror what they do, and then that increases trust with the interviewer. So if they're very, they speak in a very fast pace, I tend to do that, so I apologize, um, but they, then you might want to do that as well. And so a crude measure for success. So this is, happens in, in a journalist uh, source settings. This happens in uh, patient physician settings. This happens in legal settings. But essentially what you want is that 80% of the time, so it's not a typical formal conversation setting. So in, a, in this kind of interviewing setting, a crude measure of success is that the respondent spoke 80% of the time and you spoke maybe 20%. So um, that's usually what you should be looking for. It's not a normal conversation, but you want it to make it feel like a normal conversation. Okay, so where do you do an interview? Um, ideally, you don't wanna do it in a place where the participant gets distracted. So think of a setting where both you and the participant will not be distracted. Um, always ha be prepared to explain the purpose of the interview. You should have that down. Um, you shouldn't uh, be too, speaking of distractions. Um, so also you wanna address terms of confidentiality. And what that essentially is, is you wanna make sure that that participant and tell that participant that they will not be known, their name will be not published. So. Unlike in a journalist setting, you want to get their full name. This setting, you actually don't want to reveal their name. You might get descriptives of this person, such as their, their gender, their age, um, somewhat their position. If it's not, if it doesn't, the key is that I, sh I should not know who, who, the, who, uh, who gave me that information. Other people, other readers should not. Um, you typically should... Uh, explain, you know, how it's going to work uh, at, at the top before you start the interview process. You also might want to explain how long the interview takes. So um, oftentimes I'll take, oh, it should take around 30 minutes. Um, and sometimes they take 15 minutes. That's not ideal. Or sometimes they take an hour and 15 minutes, usually when I do interviews uh, at one time. Um, Provide contact information, so they should know how to contact you if they have any questions. Sometimes they'll say that they want uh, transcripts, their transcripts. Uh, sometimes I, they want a copy of the study when I am done. So you have to decide ahead of time if you're willing to share that information. I, I always tend to do that just because I'm very thankful for them taking the time to participate in the study. Um, allow the interviewee to, to interviewee to clarify any doubts. So if they have any doubts or questions, you know, 
you could ask them, do you have any questions before we begin, blah, blah, blah. Um, and prepare a method for recording the data. Just, it could be notes, but ideally it's audio and notes. But this is how I take notes. It's a tip for you. Um, I don't write out word for word what they say. All I do is, because I want to remember, I, I'm a big fan of probes. I'll basically just list concepts that they say as a reminder to go back and ask, okay, so you mentioned this, and then you mentioned this. Because what will happen when you ask that first question, they might talk for, you know, five minutes. So it's hard to remember everything. So how I take notes is I just write down the concepts that they said, the things that I want to ask for uh, further clarification on. Okay. Ah. Okay. So qualification criteria for an interviewer. They should be familiar with the research topic. So you should have done research ideally before you actually begin the interview process. Um, Another thing is you want to make sure that they ideally have some sort of personality and that the um, it'll be an enjoyable experience and that the participant will be able to understand the interviewer's questions. Um, it's really critical that you pick someone who is not judgmental. So you know, you should be, the participant should be able to tell you anything and you should not be judgmental about what they have to say. So just be very open and just let the, the conversation flow. Steering is really critical. So this is something that advance people who understand interviewing it's really challenging, okay? So what I find oftentimes is that sometimes the participants will answer the questions but they won't answer the questions because they are fearful of not appearing competent. They'll just talk, but oftentimes they won't actually address the question asked. So or there's so then you have to ask them, so but I you know, I wasn't quite clear, you know, you might want to ask them again that particular question, but you have to be able to recognize when the question's not being answered. And another situation, especially with, with journalists, this is a very, very common. So the whole point is to understand their world and understand how they interpret this world. What often happens, though, with professionals is they tell stories. So you'll ask them a question like, what do you mean by active listening? And then instead of telling you what they mean by that, they'll say, well, I have this story. And they'll tell you this story. But they don't articulate what they mean by it. So you might have to push that participant a little bit more to actually give you information rather than a bunch of stories. So this is very, very, very common. Um, so you just want to make sure also to test the reliability and validity of what the interviewer is saying. Um, so you can do that by looking at the literature. You can look at the responses across all the interview subjects. That's why it's important to do multiple interviews when you do this sort of thing. Um, and then make sure that that um, interviewer is good at interpreting information. So. So what I, you, they share a lot of information and then say, so is this what you're saying? Is this what you mean? And so you should ask those questions. And so someone who is a good interviewer is good at ident identifying themes on the spot. And the easiest way to go about that is to actually be familiar with the literature on that particular topic. Okay. Sequence of questions, of course, is, is important. Typically, you start with the broadest question first. Um, so, and then you ask specifics related to that question. So I do a lot of, of development of, of social science measures. So I do a lot with uh, developing scales like you would see on a survey, like a set of questions related to, like, how do I t determine whether someone is happy? How do I determine whether someone is um, experiencing anxiety. Usually it's a, a set, a list of questions, okay? So I'm, I do a lot of questionnaire development. Um, 
So you just want to make sure that you first want to start out broad and then you go narrow. Um, you want you may want to ask facts off the top of your uh, at the top of the uh, interview, or you might want to ask them toward the end. I tend to ask them. I, sw I don't know, it just varies, it depends on the length of the questionnaire, but always get descriptives, and by descriptives I mean uh, gender, position, uh, age, education, things like that. You always want to make sure to get those particular questions. Um, you might push the co controversial questions like three quarters in the uh, study. I'm more of a person about flow, like does it flow? Does it flow like a conversation? Um, so look at kind of the flow of your questions. Um, ask questions about the present before questions about the past or future. Because if you ask questions about the past or future, that might uh, affect how they answer questions about the present. So focus on the present and then ask about their history or, or what they hope may be. Um, and then always, of course, end with, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Am I missing anything? You know, always kind of give that respondent because they might feel that you didn't ask a question that you should have asked. So always ask that anything else question. Okay. The why and the what of the conversation. So basically, you're looking for themes across responses. So, or within one actually one interview setting. So what, how does that um, person uh, define competent interviewing? So I'm doing two, well actually, the study that I'm doing right now, I'm looking at um, journalistic interviewing competencies. And so I'm looking to see what areas um, journalists need to be competent in in order to be a good interviewer. And so some of that deals with nonverbals, interaction management, active listening, doing research on the subject. There's about, there's probably about, there could be up to 12 areas that a person needs to understand in order to be a competent interviewer. Um, I did a, a study also looking at several, the roles of social media communicators. So. What is a, a social media person who works for an organization and does social media for an organization? What do they see their roles as being? And so one could be recruiter of people, building communities, disseminating information. So those are all themes I found across the responses when I did a study with the social media communicators. So that's essentially what you're doing is looking for themes. And if you see a theme emerging, then you want to make sure to ask questions for all respondents related to that theme. Um, plan the design of the study. I, I, I'm very thoughtful about who I select and why I select those particular participants. So when I did the social media communicator study, there was no organization that represented social media communicators. There was no, there was one list like in Houston of the top social media influencers or something like that. So what I had to do was I went to Twitter and uh, reputable people on Twitter made up lists of the best social media communicators. And so I use that list to inform my process. This th now I'm doing this journalist journalistic interviewing study. So I did a random selection of, of newspapers and television stations and then I'm looking for the editor or producer or news director at each station. Um, I did a study, an interview study with uh, doctoral student mentoring, so how to be, how faculty can be a good doctoral student mentor. With that study, what I did was I looked at the, um, looked at all the communication doctoral programs in the United States, and then I uh, contacted the director of each program and asked them who was their best faculty uh, mentor of PhD students. So you can see then when I say, well, why were you selected? Well, the director of your program selected you as the, the, the best mentor within the PhD program. So there's a logic behind that. You conduct the interview based on your guide. And I pro provided several examples of interviews that I've done in the past. Um, then you want to transcribe it word for word. Uh, and then you analyze it. 
and basically you look for themes and sub-themes of responses across and within that interview. And then you want to verify that. So you can do that by um, asking another person to see if you they found similar themes as you found. Um, and then you want to report your findings. And so typically you, you report the themes that emerge, the concepts that emerge across the participants. And then you might look for literature to explain those results or how those results came to be. Um, so the interview procedure, you want to make sure your tape recorder is working. Key, one, one, and only one question at a time. Be as neutral as, as, as possible. Um, make sure to not lose control of that interview. Uh, when you're taking notes, remember it's important, it's good to take notes, but you also remember that you are engaged with this person and if your note taking is taken away from that, you need to figure out another strategy to take notes, okay? And then you might provide transitions between major topics. So let me transition. We talked about this. Now we're going to talk about this. So you could do that as well. Uh, after the interview, verify that the tape recorder worked. You might make notes or field notes if you did a face-to-face -face interview. You might make notes about themes that you saw, uh, questions that should be asked on future uh, interview with interviewees. You might look record the nonverbal behaviors. You might record the setting. Um, anything that you think that would be useful uh, for your study. And then this is just just a reminder that. So you might, for your interview study, if you were going to actually carry out a research project, you might do like 15 interviews. So, but ideally after each pair of interviews, you look to see what responses are coming up and think about any other questions that you might ask with the other interviewees. So it, it's constantly evolving and, and changing. So I'll give you a couple examples. So uh, I did a, the study with the social media communicator. So what I was looking for was one study was looking at whether they experienced any role stress. So role ambiguity, which means that they don't really know what their role is or how to be a good person uh, within that role and perform effectively or role conflict when basically leadership has conflicting expectations about their role. Um, so I wanted to explore whether they experienced that. And what I found was they weren't really experiencing role conflict because leadership didn't really know what a social media communicator should do. But what they were experiencing was a role ambiguity. And so then what I decided to do was further explore how they handled that and how they managed that and how they defined their role. And that became an interesting study. So that's kind of an example of how you want to, you know, make sure to understand and be prepared to let the participants, you know, affect the flow of your study and the flow of your results and recognize when there's some great information out there that you might not have expected. Okay, so just keep reviewing your situation and reviewing your notes. Um, the coding process, essentially you have everything transcribed and I, there's a video that I provided that should more clearly articulate how that coding process works. But essentially, you just are writing notes along the side and you're, you're looking for potential concepts so that you're finding across the answers. So concepts or keywords. Um, so just look to see, uh, look at that video, see how that works. And then once you transcribe that and once you code that thematically, then you want to think about is there any other literature that could help me understand these results? So um, we're going to talk about social science. To We've talked about that last week, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more. It's important to use primary research in order to inform your writing and inform your findings. So here you have the coding process. So you just write down codes, potential concepts. Memos might be like, um, you know, noting ideas as they occur, um, looking for patterns, uh, relationships among uh, particular types of participants, differences, similarities across participants. 
Um, you might want to, you know, think about more questions that this might raise. You want to explore patterns. Um, so again, it's just, it takes a long time to code actually. Once you have the interview, it's, it's much actually much simpler once you do a quantitative study because the data just comes to you, you analyze the data and that's it. But it's, it's definitely more of an involved process when you're, you're, uh, coding for themes. So again, the, the key thing is themes, concepts. So what concepts do they use to describe their experience? I want to emphasize that. So probes are important to get to these concepts, but it's your job to identify those concepts and what they mean by those concepts, okay? So I, I really like this visual because this kind of shows you what you're, visually shows you what you're aiming for. So you kind of start off with this broad open area and then you dig deeper and dig deeper. And what you're doing is trying to defend the concepts or themes that you found and actually defend those labels. So you have to provide evidence as to why you think that theme exists across your uh, interviews. So this is kind of the ultimate goal is to develop a theoretical concept. So theoretical concepts are things that we say that exist, but we don't necessarily directly observe that concept. So it could be something as such as a communication competence. We know some people are better at uh, communicating competently and some people are not. So we say this thing exists, and we have to figure out a way to, to measure whether this exists. Depression, you know, what are ways that we can measure depression? We say it exists, but, you know, how do we go about measuring that? Um, what are some other things? Uh, news quality. So news quality we say exists. So what are some evidence? And so you might interview some journalists about how they define news quality. And so what does news quality look like? We say it exists. So what evidence uh, do we have to support that it exists? Okay. And how do we know when to stop? So this is most often how people say or why uh, people who do interviews, how they say they stop is basically they've reached data sat saturation. So what this essentially means is if I did another three interviews or another one interview, the likelihood that I get any new information or identify any new themes or concepts is very low. So what happens is after a while you start, you interview people and you kind of, the responses are somewhat similar. So you're not really finding anything unique or new. And that's kind of what should be guiding you about when do you stop the interview process. So typically it's data or theoretical uh, saturation is when you decide to end. Okay, and that's all we have for this particular lecture. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And of course, if you have any questions, just contact me.